Have you ever waited for your favorite band's new CD to come out, and then when it did, you actually listened to the whole thing? What about a video game? Have you ever waited in line for a video game's release? Guilty as charged. I've waited and waited for the long, hyped up new game and then picked it up, maybe even after waiting in line for GameStop's doors to open. Then, stayed up all night playing it with friends and into the morning. Now it's all different. It's all online, and the hype and the newness has dramatically declined. The anticipation for new feelings, emotions, and epic stories has all but disappeared, and it's a constant chase down a rabbit hole that may never again be satiated. But why has the content value of our beloved games diminished? Graphics quality. My theory is that as graphics quality goes up, storytelling and impact severely declines. Now, we expect realistic, lifelike graphics because naturally, as time goes on, graphic quality has gone up, raising the bar. But the problem is, we expect story quality to match. Unfortunately, when graphics are so impeccable, the story must also be just as amazing. In the early days of video games, graphics were limited by the abilities of the PC or the console. Today, we can produce nearly lifelike representations of almost anything we can imagine. Laziness. Much like with music, there are formulas at work in the depths and inner workings of music and video games. If you don't believe me, watch my video on music next about Max Martin and Dr. Luke. Formulas for music very much exist. They amass billions of dollars for those tugging at the strings, and even still today. While it's much less prevalent in music today, it is a true theme that exists in games as well. Companies have made their own success stories, and it's as much to do with formulaic patterns and rewards, stimulating seeking behaviors of the better part of the population. You play a game because you think you enjoy it, when in reality, you have been conditioned to enjoy it because you, knowingly or not, constantly seek and receive rewards. By now, you're probably thinking you know what this is about, dopamine, but you'd be wrong. Scientists now believe that dopamine is simply responsible for encouraging you, so to speak, to repeat pleasurable activity rather than producing pleasure directly. To illustrate, consider the brain on drugs. Drugs interfere with the way the brain sends, receives, and processes signals. Drugs like marijuana and heroin activate those signals in the brain because their chemical structure mimics the natural communication system of the brain. This allows drugs to attach to receptors in the brain and trick you into thinking or feeling something. Other drugs like amphetamines or cocaine cause the brain to release abnormally large amounts of signals in response. This further disrupts the natural processes of the brain. I'm sure you're thinking, well, that's great, but what does this have to do with video games? Stay with me, we'll get to that, but you need to know this first. The Basal Ganglia Your brain consists of many parts, one of which is the basal ganglia, responsible for the pleasurable effects of activities like eating, socializing, and sex, and yes, video games. The basal ganglia are involved in forming habits. When you engage in a behavior your body sees as positive, your basal ganglia are at work. And when you consistently do this, your body adapts and accepts nothing less than the desired behavior and doesn't allow for any substitution. So when you fed your brain the beautifully crafted games of the past, your brain liked it a lot. So much in fact that no subpar game will ever take its place. Your threshold for pleasure has been set so high that nearly no other video games will ever come close to the ones you hold so dear in your heart. So does that mean that no other game will ever match the quality of games like Zelda, GoldenEye, or Mario Kart? Well, no, but there are other factors at play. Games simply are not as challenging as they once were, and people actually like challenge. But even more so, people want to succeed and be recognized. Today, games have challenges, but they are relatively easy to overcome, and you are highly praised when you overcome a feat, be it with loot or other positive rewards. Your hands are being held, and you are guided all the way to your destination. These mindless and simple activities reaffirm that you are doing good at the game, and you've accomplished something. Hey, congratulations, you're amazing at this game. Thus, this feeds the never-ending cycle of self-affirmation and generating positivity related to this adventure. People like feeling positive, so naturally we keep coming back, even if the latest game is something of a letdown. Another fuel to the fire is the fact that companies know their clients, and the formula for our attention is a simple one, yet complex all the same. 
people are attracted to bright, flashing colors and loads of endless action. Maybe because we were raised on movies like Terminator and the famous Christmas movie, Die Hard. Because we are attracted to this vibrancy and action, games like Diablo 3, Warcraft, and others use very bright colors that coordinate with magical spells and extensive and intricate animations. This action and these colors keep our attention and have a fascinating allure that is almost inexplicable. So what went wrong? Diablo 2 is an all-time favorite game of mine. It has an intelligently crafted story and basic yet complex playing style that is old news by today's standards. It had a beautiful blend of decent graphics for the time and a different view of the world. Yet at the time, it was groundbreaking and it set the standard for RPG games today. The thing is, today a game like this seems outdated and lacking in creativity despite the many who replicate the style to the T. But why? The graphics. Looking at graphics alone, they're nothing special and games like it now are a dime a dozen. Then Diablo 3 came out and changed all of that. But what happened there? Diablo 3 was successful, but many diehard Diablo 2 fans are actually disappointed by it, and quite frankly, disgusted by it. It no longer had a cohesive story, and it was not very well written or told. And the interface was completely different and lacked creativity and ingenuity. And you had a limited set of skills that are totally linear. The original Diablo 2 creators were given the boot, and the new creators of Diablo 3 focused on radiant scale animations and colors rather than on the impact of a great story, harmoniously blended with intuitive skill trees and graphics. The best thing that it had going for it was the auction house, and they quickly got rid of that once they realized that it benefited the players more than Blizzard themselves. Diablo 2, in comparison, created a massive marketplace for the gamers. I personally even sold items on eBay back when it was at its peak, but today the D3 crowd is almost entirely a new breed, with the Diablo 2 fans dying off slowly and avoiding the game like the plague, save for a few diehard fans. My question is, will Diablo 4 fix this problem? and unite the D2 and D3 fans with an exquisite combination of storytelling and graphics. Only time will tell. But let's get back on track. Why the heck are games now so stinking bad? Commercial pressures. Game developers face pressure to produce games that not only sell well, but generate massive revenue. As a result, the focus is on developing games that follow the same formula as successful games of the past, rather than taking risks and exploring new ideas. Lack of diversity. The gaming industry has traditionally been controlled by a select few mega corporations. This leads to a lack of diversity in the viewpoints and the concepts that go into game development. People tend to gravitate towards what they're familiar with, and the industry has learned to capitalize on this by re-releasing and remastering games that have previously been released many times before. After all, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Developmental constraints. The process of game development has its limitations like time, resources, and finances. These limitations restrict the extent to which game developers can explore and experiment with creative, innovative, and new ideas. This promotes a process where developers play it safe by building on those familiar concepts and just making minor tweaks to a new version of their previous games. Most importantly, risk aversion. Game development is a high-risk industry, and many game developers are averse to risk in their approach to game design. This leads to a reluctance to try new ideas and leads to sticking with tried and tested formulas. It's only natural to avoid risk when things seem to be going well. And last but not least, lack of innovation. Many designers lack vision or creative spark. They simply are not capable of creating innovative game designs. And the industry itself is to blame because it fosters this laziness and this lack of creativity by pushing reboots and revisions over innovation. Just look at some of the most successful games in the history of games that have been reinvented. Grand Theft Auto. And how many of those are out now? Call of Duty. There's probably 19 different versions. Assassin's Creed. There's at least 12 of those. Warcraft with five core games and nine major expansions. Even Diablo and StarCraft have multiple releases and remasters. But why? 
Well, that's obvious. Game developers know what sells, and they want to piggyback on their own success, and what better way to do that than simply just reskin an old game with newer, better graphics, and haphazardly tack on a revised story with very little thought. This has led to the lack of creativity in games today, and somehow, these games are still successful. When companies go ambitious and try something new, they take the chance that people won't accept their creation. It might actually fail. And there's too massive of an investment involved in creating an experimental piece only to have it fail. So why do people keep coming back? They're distracted. Again, the beautiful imagery and graphics. We tend to see beauty at face value and we don't get too tied up on the details. If the game itself is attractive enough, we get immersed in the scenery and the scale of the game. But now, beauty and scale are the norm, so great games need something else. Something that we are not being given, and something that we're not even used to. Video games now just feel so lazy. Also, Stockholm Syndrome. Many popular games today lack diversity to the extreme, so much so that you're repeating the same events, raids, or whatever over and over again to acquire loot. People log so many hours just completing meaningless missions that they develop an affinity to a game just because of the time that they invest in it, and it would be hard to let go of. The more time you spend with something, the more you grow to like it. These are some of the best games ever released, in my opinion. GoldenEye and the copycat Perfect Dark, which I personally think was better. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2, Mario Kart 64, Diablo 2, Fallout 3, Battlefield Bad Company 2, Grand Theft Auto 3, Zelda, Sonic, Super Mario World, Time Splitters, and Call of Duty Modern Warfare. What games are on your list? Be sure to check out this video about Russia, China, and North Korea's collaboration on nuclear war. Thanks for watching. The thought of Russia, China, and North Korea collaborating on nuclear power and strategy is enough to send shivers down one's spine. The mere idea of these formidable nations joining forces in the nuclear realm is a chilling reminder of the immense power and destruction that could be unleashed upon the world. As tensions continue to rise in the world, the possibility of this hypothetical alliance becoming reality is a thought that should keep us all up at night. What evidence is there that Russia is conspiring with leaders in China and North Korea? What are these countries capable of? And more importantly, what is the possibility that we are the target?